These odd-looking fish are reticulated hillstream loaches, and during the course of this video I will be teaching you everything that you need to know in order to keep and breed these amazing animals. The video will include information about their anatomy, how to sex them, how to set up their tank, and what to feed them, as well as information about filtration and water movement, lighting, and plants. We'll also take a look at how they spawn, and even take a look at their babies. And if you've never seen one of my videos before, buckle up, cowboy, you're in for a treat. There are over 200 species of fish that are commonly known as a hillstream loach, and this documentary focuses on what is probably the most beautiful of them all, the reticulated hillstream loach. When these fish were first introduced into the hobby, they were said to be quite difficult to keep and breed. It was believed that they needed very specific conditions in order to survive, such as fast-moving, cool water with lots of dissolved oxygen in it. Which makes sense because those are the type of conditions that we see in the wild. However, fish keepers have now realized that these fish don't necessarily need high flow and cool water in order to live and breed. They can, in fact, survive and reproduce in tanks that have very little water movement and relatively high water temperatures. However, this is not the type of environment that these fish are adapted to live in. In the wild, hillstream loaches live in cool, fast-moving mountain streams that have high levels of dissolved oxygen. The water in these streams is typically clear and shallow, which allows sunlight to penetrate all the way down to the bottom of the stream, which is known as the stream bed. The stream bed consists of a combination of different sized rocks and gravel that have all been worn down and made smooth by the erosive force of the rushing water. These rocky, sunlit surfaces provide an ideal environment for the growth of algae and biofilms, both of which will serve as an important food source for the loaches and their young. And other than algae, there's very little in the way of plant life growing in these mountain streams. The fast-moving water prevents the buildup of sediment, so there's very little silt or sand in these high-flow areas. The water is cool and has high levels of dissolved oxygen, and when it rains, these mountain streams can quickly turn into raging rivers that flush out the stream bed and wash away anything that's not held securely in place. And that's where the hillstream loach really shines. They have a flattened body design that's specially adapted to cope with the fast-moving water. And the entire body functions like one big suction cup that helps keep the loaches from being washed away by the rushing water. When fish breathe, the water goes in through the mouth where it then passes by the gills before the water leaves the body through a special opening known as the operculum. The hillstream loach has a very small operculum and relatively small gills for a fish of its size. Both the small operculum and small gills are probably the result of living in oxygen-rich water. Hillstream loaches don't have any teeth in either jaw, but they do have very small teeth at the back of the throat, known as pharyngeal teeth, that are used to help process their food. The mouth has three pairs of barbels that they use to help them find their food. These barbels are surrounded by lots of bumpy structures that are used for scraping the surfaces of rocks or for rasping at things like spinach leaves.
The barbels are also used to comb through algae and pick out the microorganisms that live on it. And I see my hillstream loaches feeding like this a lot, but I've never seen them actually eat the algae itself. Their mouths are not really designed for grabbing things and tearing at them, and the chances of these loaches taking care of your hair algae problems is very small. Moving a little further back on the body, we come to the pectoral fins. Both the pectoral fins and the pelvic fins are enlarged, and they're oriented horizontally like the wings of an airplane, rather than vertically like the pectoral fins of most fish. This arrangement enables the loach to keep its fins in constant contact with the substrate. And all four of these fins can operate independently of each other, with each fin functioning as its own separate suction cup to help anchor the fish to the substrate and keep it from being swept away. Each fin can also be moved without breaking the seal, which allows them to walk up vertical inclines like waterfalls or even the glass walls of your aquarium. And you'll often see a hillstream loach fluttering this part of its pectoral fin. What you're witnessing is the movement of a valve that controls what's known as a flutter channel. And here's a very brief explanation of how it works. Water enters the bottom part of the fish right here and then exits through here. The flutter channel runs in between these two points and is used to control the amount of water and the pressure levels beneath the fish. And there are two flutter channels, one on each side of the fish. There are several differences between male and female hillstream loaches, and there's one that's rarely ever mentioned, so let's start with that one first. The fish seen here is a sexually mature male, and at the front portion of both of its pectoral fins, you'll find these modified pectoral fin rays. On the reticulated hillstream loach, the first five or six rays on the males are enlarged and look very different from the unmodified rays of the female. These modified pectoral fin rays can go by several different technical names. Only males have these modified pectoral fins, but you'll have to look pretty closely to see them. And what I find to be most interesting is that no one knows what these structures are for. However, Mother Nature doesn't typically spend time and resources creating things that have no purpose. Nonetheless, many different species of loaches have these modified pectoral fin rays, and I suppose we'll eventually figure out what purpose they serve. But, for the time being, the exact number, location, and arrangement of these modified fin rays is very useful for helping to distinguish between similar-looking species of hillstream loach. And it's also a great way to tell the males from the females, but there's got to be more to it than that. Here's a male attached to the glass. Be sure to notice the colored areas at the front of his pectoral fins. Those are the mysterious organs that only appear on the males. And just so you have something to compare it to, here's a mature female. Be sure to notice that there are no modified fin rays at the front of her pectoral fins. Another telltale sign of a male is that the males have lots of these tiny bumps, known as papilla, all around the edge of the mouth, while the females have just a few, if they have any at all.
Both of the things that I just mentioned can be difficult to see. So the best way to tell the difference between males and females is to observe the outline of the area where the head and pectoral fins meet. When viewed either from above or from the underside, such as we see them here, males have a very pronounced head that's distinct from the pectoral fin, while in the female the transition between these two areas is much more subtle. Another helpful hint is that on males, this outer margin of the pectoral fin forms more of a straight line, while on the females, this outer edge has more of a continuous curve. If you intend on breeding your hillstream loaches, then obviously you'll want to be sure that you buy both a male and a female. And since these fish are usually sold as unsexed juveniles, where it can be hard to tell the sexes apart, the best way to ensure that you have both males and females is to buy six young fish. Then the odds of you having both sexes are very high. I got six unsexed juveniles to start my breeding colony and I was very lucky to end up with three males and three females. However, these fish can be a bit pricey, usually running somewhere around 15 US dollars per fish. So many people will choose to buy only one. And yes, one hill stream loach can live by itself, but a group of three or more will be a far more rewarding experience in the long run because hillstream loaches are pretty social fish, so they interact with each other a lot, and it can be quite entertaining to watch. They also tend to be more visible and outgoing if you have several of them in the same tank. How you set up the tank will be determined by what you intend to do with the fish, but for the sake of this video, we'll just assume that you plan on breeding your hillstream loaches. To begin with, as a general rule, you'll get much better results in a mature tank that contains a lot of rounded river stones, so it's best to get your breeding tank up and running long before you introduce the fish. I like to begin by flooding the tank with lots of light to encourage the growth of algae and develop a healthy layer of biofilm over all of the surfaces inside the tank. A bright light left on for 12 or more hours a day will encourage the growth of algae on the rocks and the glass. I only clean the glass at the front of the tank and let algae grow on the other three panes of glass. But before I put anything in the tank, I line the bottom with egg crate. The egg crate ensures that no part of the rock ever touches the glass. Aquarium glass is remarkably strong and can withstand a lot of weight being placed on it. But if the sharp pointed end of a rock is resting directly on the glass, it can cause a crack. So I use the egg crate to keep the rocks away from the glass. Then I covered the egg crate with two inches of pool filter sand. Next, I collected rocks along a local river bank, brought them home, and gave them a thorough cleaning. Rocks that are a little bigger than a human fist are about the right size, but you take what you can get and it looks a lot more natural if you mix it up a little. Rocks that are round and fairly smooth work the best and always try to avoid rocks with sharp edges. These rock piles will not only provide lots of surfaces for the loaches to graze on, but they'll also create lots of cracks and crevices where the eggs will settle and develop after spawning. Providing these fish with a large pile of rocks will be important to see any real success, and in my opinion, the more rocks, the better. If you're serious about breeding these fish, or any fish for that matter, then it's usually best done in a tank that's devoted to just one species, because any tank mates that you get are more than likely to eat at least some, if not all, of the eggs and the babies. 
But just so you know, hillstream loaches are peaceful fish that will do well in a mature tank containing other peaceful species. They can be a little aggressive at feeding time, but like I mentioned earlier, they don't have any teeth, so they can't really harm anyone, but they could outcompete a more timid species. Keeping hillstream loaches with bettas is possible but could be problematic because bettas like their water to be right around 80 degrees Fahrenheit, while the loaches prefer the low 70s. Bettas also prefer calm water while the hillstream loaches prefer moving water, so they're incompatible in that regard as well. But that doesn't mean that you can't keep a hillstream loach and a betta together. It just means that one of them, or maybe both of them, will have to live in a less than ideal environment. Keeping hillstream loaches with goldfish is also a concern. Yes, they both prefer cooler water temperatures, but the goldfish also prefers a low flow environment, while the loaches really like to have their water moving. I currently have six adult hillstream loaches and a bunch of their babies in a 40 gallon tank. I would also consider putting three to four adults in a 20 gallon long tank. And in my opinion, 10 gallon tanks are too small for keeping hillstream loaches. I filter my 40 gallon breeder tank using a single large sponge filter. And one of the nice things about sponge filters is that they're completely safe for the adults, their eggs, and the tiny babies. Other filters, such as canister filters and hang-on-back filters, can suck up eggs and babies if the water intakes on those devices are not covered with a sponge to prevent eggs and fry from being pulled into the filter intake. So, if your filter intake isn't protected with a sponge, then you'll want to check the inside of your canister filter or the water reservoir at the back of your hang-on back filter every once in a while for eggs and fry. It's important to note that just because these fish can survive in aquariums where there's very little water movement does not mean that it's good for them in the long run. Hillstream loaches have small gills for a fish of their size, so it's important that their water contains a lot of oxygen. Moving water carries more oxygen than still water, and cold water carries more oxygen than warm water. So as the temperature of the water increases, you'll need to increase the amount of water movement in the tank. Moving water is also beneficial to the eggs because it helps keep them oxygenated and free of debris, but the loaches also need relatively calm areas in the tank where the newly spawned eggs can settle and where the newborn babies can move around without being swept away by the current. Ideally, the aquarium should contain areas where there's a lot of water movement as well as areas where there's very little. Strong lighting is preferred because it encourages the growth of algae. In the initial setup, before you add the fish, it can be helpful to turn the lights on and leave them on for as long as you can. And I'll sometimes leave the lights on for 24 hours a day to get a quick growth of algae on the rocks. You can even add extra lights in the beginning to get things started and then remove them once you've gotten the results you need. The key is to encourage the growth of some algae on the rocks while not allowing it to get out of control and take over your tank. As far as the addition of aquatic plants goes, other than algae, aquatic plants are not a normal part of their environment in the wild. But that doesn't mean you couldn't add a few plants to the tank if that's what you wanted. One of the many Anubia species would be a good choice. They have large leaves with lots of surface area for the loaches to graze on. Anubius plants are also very sturdy and easy to grow. 
Driftwood can be added to the tank, which will provide different feeding opportunities for the fish, as well as the tiny invertebrates that will become part of the food chain. Covering your tank is a good idea, and this is especially important if you have a rimless tank, because these fish will climb out, and this is even more likely to occur if there's moving water. Hillstream loaches are not difficult to feed because they'll take many different prepared foods. I feed mine a staple diet of tetratropical granules and spirulina pellets. But I like to mix things up and I'll also give them blanched spinach or zucchini, raw cucumber, or small frozen bloodworms. And if I notice that there are small babies in the tank, I'll also add some microworms. But for long-term breeding success, I feel that it's important to provide them with lots of the naturally occurring algae and biofilms that will grow on the rocks and glass walls of the tank. The algae and the biofilms will provide a constant source of food for both the adults and the newborn young. And this readily available supply of food is especially helpful if you're trying to breed them. And there's one final note with regards to feeding. Hillstream loaches can be very competitive at feeding time, so it's best to place the food in several different areas of the tank so that everyone has a chance to eat. I also try to keep the food on the sand at the front of the tank so as to avoid getting it in between the rocks where there might be eggs. I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's worth repeating. Breeding is always best done in a single species setup, and getting my Hillstream loaches to breed was not very difficult. Three months after buying them, I began to find babies in the tank, but I never saw them spawn and I was curious to know how they made it because I wanted to capture it on film. So I began to search for answers online and that's when I realized that there's a lot of conflicting information out there about how hillstream loaches spawn. And the problem stems from the use of the generic term hillstream loach, because there are several different species of fish commonly referred to as hillstream loaches and they don't all reproduce in the same way. Some Chinese hillstream loaches dig a pit in the substrate where they lay the eggs and then guard them until they hatch. The reticulated hillstream loach, which does not occur in China, is an egg scatterer. The male and female spawn in the middle of the water column and scatter their eggs to the current. The tiny eggs are washed downstream and then drift in the current until they sink to the bottom of the stream bed where they'll settle down in the little spaces in between the rocks. So breeding tanks should be set up with large piles of rounded stones where the fertilized eggs can settle and develop. Otherwise, these eggs are left out in the open where they might be eaten by hungry tank mates or caught up in the filter. Good water flow throughout the tank will help to ensure that the eggs get a proper amount of oxygen and remain free of debris. But these fish are fairly versatile and can still reproduce in tanks where there's very little water movement. When doing water changes in the breeding tank, avoid removing water anywhere near the substrate or it's possible that you'll be removing babies as well as eggs, both of which are very, very small. Hillstream loaches are incredibly small when they're born, and I'm assuming that this one is about three or four days old because it's already used up the contents of its yolk sac. I find these tiny babies by searching for them at the front of the tank with a magnifying glass. 
They're about the size of a grain of sand, and they don't swim very well because they don't have a swim bladder, so they get around by hopping from one grain of sand to the next. And they're not graceful by any means, but they're very alert and surprisingly quick when they need to be. I don't have to do anything special for them other than to add some microworms to the tank every couple days or so. Newly hatched baby brine shrimp would also work. But I probably don't even have to do that because this is a mature tank with a wide variety of different microorganisms, algae, mulm, and biofilms that provide a near constant food supply for the growing young. The barbels that they use to help them find their food are much more obvious on the babies than on the adults. Here are some young fry using their barbels to find and feed on the microorganisms that live and breed inside this little algal forest. While many fish keepers would like to avoid algae, in this particular situation the algae forms an important part of the food web that helps keep these fish happy and healthy. But every so often I have to remove some of the algae because the growth gets a bit excessive. This tank is also home to bladder snails, ramshorn snails, and Malaysian trumpet snails, and every now and then I have to remove some of them as well. I don't clean the substrate, and I rarely ever clean the sponge filter. I change four gallons of water each month, and other than keeping them fed, that's just about all that I do as far as the tank maintenance goes. And these fish are breeding like crazy. They don't have a lot of young all at once, but they're consistently producing more babies. And I've noticed if you remove the fry from the parent's breeding tank, the fry will grow much more slowly than if they remained with the parents. So I've decided to start keeping the fry in the breeding tank with the adults instead of putting them in their own grow-out tank. It might just be that the grow-out tank wasn't mature enough and didn't contain enough algae and biofilm for the young fry, so their growth was stunted. Or it could be that the fry needed to remain in contact with the beneficial bacteria produced by the parents and excreted in their waste. Either way, I think I've found a system that works, and I'll continue to refine my methods and set up even more tanks for these odd little fish. Well, that's about it for this in-depth documentary on the Hillstream Loach. Hopefully I was able to show you some things that you've never seen before, and maybe you learned a few things along the way. Please help support my effort to continue bringing you these in-depth documentaries by supporting this channel in any way that you can. Thanks for watching, and have a beautiful day.